Hi, I'm Pete Brubaker, a staff engineer with Qualcomm Technologies. Today, I'm going to introduce you to the graphics pipeline. This is a screen capture of a demo scene running on mobile hardware. As you're going to see, the results we are able to achieve on mobile hardware are exceptional. Building scenes like this requires solid knowledge of mobile hardware and graphics APIs. In this presentation, we're going to introduce and explain the graphics pipeline from a high level. What is a graphics pipeline? A graphics pipeline is a set of software and hardware to render 3D geometry onto a 2D surface. The pipeline has evolved over years through many revisions of APIs like OpenGL and DirectX. Most of the heavy computational work is accelerated by specialized hardware. The image on the left is a highly detailed mesh and is shown flat shaded and rendered on the right. Let's dig deeper into the pipeline and see what happens inside the pipeline to create the final image. The pipeline starts with object geometry defined in a mesh, a series of connected points. We call these points vertices. Each vertex has attributes such as position, one or more sets of texture coordinates, surface normal, and color. These attributes are sent by the application to the graphics driver to be rendered. The graphics driver is a low-level library that commands the graphics hardware and implements a high-level graphics API. The vertex shader is responsible for transforming the vertices from object coordinate space to window coordinate space. You can think of this as projecting points onto a 2D plane. Traditionally, this is done efficiently by performing a single matrix transformation of the vertex position. The matrix is calculated by concatenating several matrices together. These matrices convert each vertex from object coordinate space to eye coordinate space or camera coordinate space to normalize device coordinate space and then finally to window coordinate space. The driver assembles the transformed vertices into triangles. This is either done with the ordering of the vertices or with a separate buffer describing the connection of the mesh. Attributes for the vertices are collected as well. The triangles are then clipped against the frustrum and the guard band. Triangles can be optionally culled and removed if they are front or back facing. Now the graphics hardware rasterizes the triangles. A scan line algorithm which works by processing the triangle row by row is generally used. Each pixel, now called a fragment, which is covered by the triangle is then sent to be further processed. Attributes for the fragments are also calculated by linearly interpolating the values from each of the three vertices. The fragment shader is where the color of the pixel and the depth of the pixel are calculated and written to buffers. Fragment shaders are complex shaders that combine textures, lighting calculations, material properties, and sometimes post-processing effects. Once this step is complete, the fragment is passed on to the final step. Per-pixel operations are where testing and blending occur for the final pixel. Depending on the state set in the graphics API, the pixel is written to the frame buffer. An example of this would be alpha blending. The pixel is blended with any existing pixels based on the alpha value. Now let's talk about the evolution of the pipelines for a little bit. In OpenGL ES1, the pipeline was fixed. Essentially, you could switch things on or off, but it was impossible to custom program the pipeline. In OpenGL ES2, was a significant milestone for mobile graphics. Custom vertex and fragment shaders allowed a programmer to customize the pipeline. Some of the important features added in OpenGL2 are programmable blocks for vertex and fragment shading. These shaders replace the transform and lighting fixed functions that were normally switched on or off. The programmable pipeline allows developers to use many more rendering techniques, and the shaders allow for much more rich materials and lighting effects to be calculated. With OpenGL ES3, the next generation of graphics hardware allowed even more advanced features to be implemented in mobile games. GL ES3 is backwards compatible with GL ES2, and additional API functionality that was added in OpenGL ES3 include occlusion queries, vertex array objects, uniform buffers, transform feedback, sometimes called stream out, instanced rendering, multiple render targets, and full support for integer and 32-bit floating point operations and shaders. The API also introduced new texture compression formats called ETC2 and EAC. Also advanced texturing functionality, including guaranteed support for floating point textures, 3D textures, depth textures, vertex textures, non-power of two textures, red and red-green only channel textures, immutable textures, 2D array textures, swizzles, LED and MIP level clamps, seamless cube maps, and sampler objects. 
OpenGL ES 3.1 and the Android extension pack provide additional functionality to the developer. OpenGL ES 3.1 is backwards compatible with 3.0 and 2.0. New features include compute shaders, separate shader objects, indirect draw commands, enhanced texturing including texture gather, multi-sample textures, stencil textures, and enhanced shading language functionality. The Android extension pack is a set of new extensions over GLES 3.1. New features in that include tessellation shaders, geometry shaders, and ASTC texture compression. Next, let's cover some of the practical examples for version 3 of the OpenGLES API. First, it added ETC2 and EAC texture compression. This is a compressed format supporting textures with and without alpha channels. It has improved quality over ETC1 and other formats. It is a standard texture compression method that makes development easier on Android. You are no longer required to use vendor-specific compression formats in your pipelines. It also added percentage closer filtered shadows. They provide smoother and realistic dynamic shadows while filtering out much of the aliasing artifacts. Improves the quality of depth map shadows by filtering the results of the depth comparison, producing softer shadow edges. Another powerful feature is geometry instancing. With instancing, you can render multiple instances of the geometry with a single draw call. Vertex data is shared between objects, but other object properties may vary per instance. Instancing is especially important on mobile GPUs where there is typically a high CPU overhead per draw call. GLES 3 also added support for sRGB textures. Using sRGB textures is an optimization for linear lighting pipelines, which results in improved contrast while preserving detail in dark areas of the image. Uniform buffers. This is an optimization for providing uniform data to shader programs. Switching a uniform buffer binding is typically faster than switching an individual uniform value. Uniform buffers can store larger blocks of data that can be shared between different programs, like a matrix transform, etc. Transform feedback. This allows for the preservation of the post-transform state of primitives processed by a vertex shader. State is written out to a buffer object and then can be resubmitted for use in sub subsequent GPU processes. This can be used as a substantial optimization for particle systems. Lastly is uh, vertex array objects. It's an optimization and simplification for binding vertex attributes. After initialization of the VAO, the vertex attributes can be bound in a single call. Use of VAOs can allow driver level optimizations such as the vertex layout and relationship to the index buffer is maintained. Multiple render targets render to multiple surfaces at the same time. This reduces or eliminates the need to perform multiple rendering passes to write data to different targets. The common use for this is to implement deferred shading or deferred lighting pipelines. Floating point textures were also added. Higher precision allows for more complex shading effects as well as compute operations which store the results in textures. And lastly, it added support for 3D textures. It's used for pre-calculating animated effects and volumetric effects. And the last feature that was added in OpenGLES 3.1 in the Android extension pack are tessellation shaders. Uh, GPU creation of triangles from low resolution meshes. You can create detail uh, from a low resolution mesh. Saves memory bandwidth and footprint because the GPU is creating additional geometry without the need to send anything through the bus to the GPU. It provides ability to render very smooth and highly detailed scenes Thanks for watching this video on an overview of the graphics pipeline. Visit Qualcomm Developer Network to learn more about graphics and tools on Qualcomm's mobile hardware.